Welcome to Name Three Songs. I'm Sarah Fagan. And I'm Jenna Million. And this is the podcast where we take the piss and debunk music fan stereotypes. Because let's be honest, fangirls knew about that band way before you did. And this is Music Meltdown, where we talk about our personal stories as fangirls and some hot takes on hot topics. So today, we're going to be talking about bands that we didn't like at the time when they were becoming popular for one reason or another. And then later, we started to appreciate these bands more and we're kind of like kicking ourselves for not joining the bandwagon, so to speak, um, at the time. And then also on the other side of that, it's kind of like loving bands and then falling off for one reason or another. But before we get into that, we just wanted to say some words, both thanks to everyone who's been listening and some fun anecdotes to kick off the episode. I just want to thank you guys so much because like I think every episode for the past month has had over a hundred listens which doesn't sound like a big deal but for us as like not real famous women um (laughs) we feel like famous women (laughs) the amount of like voice notes that Jenna and I have sent to each other just like screaming being like somebody dm'd us telling us we have good ideas it's so heartwarming like my I had we had zero expectations for this like we literally just wanted to do this for fun because we'd be having these conversations anyways yeah exactly and like the fact that people care what we're saying like means so much (laughs) (laughs) like it's insane but also so amazing because like I like when we started I was like I don't think anyone's gonna listen to this except for our like five friends each and like the three friends that cross over and then it was like oh no (laughs) It's just so, it's so insane to me that, like, I posted a TikTok video as a joke, and then people were like, we're going to come listen to your podcast. And I was like, oh, wow, thanks, TikTok. Like, Yeah, TikTok has been amazing for <laughs> random people on the internet finding our podcast. Like, as somebody who's, like, used the internet since, like, the internet's been, like, accessible to teen girls, like, it's just crazy how specific the TikTok algorithm is and, like, how helpful it is. <laughs> I'm just, like, can't. Thank you, TikTok. Please sponsor us. <laughs> like, TikTok, give us a ring. Like, let us know what's going on. I just love how we can post about, like, everything from like the 1975 to like me crying over Machine Gun Kelly and people are like that's for us. Speaking of Machine Gun Kelly (laughs) I have a fun story. Okay so clearly um we've been listening to Machine Gun Kelly maybe a little bit too much. I don't know if you can listen to Machine Gun Kelly too much but um I had a dream last night that Sarah and I were at a Machine Gun Kelly concert And then somehow we became friends with him and hung out with him literally all night until the sun rose. And I just need this dream to come true. (laughs) (laughs) I've never needed something more in my life than the opportunity to hang out with Machine Gun Kelly until (laughs) until the next day. Yeah, (laughs) it was like all chaos broke loose. I think he was like staying. I feel like him and his crew were like staying at my house or something. So we were just like drinking and kicking it literally till the sun rose. I love how you had a dream about Machine Gun Kelly being a proper pop punk artist that's like touring in a van and needs to sleep at people's houses. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I know. (laughs) He would. He's like rich enough to stay in hotels. But like, no, he was staying at my house. He, like, put out a call on Twitter being like, we're going to be in Austin. Like, we need a place to crash. There's seven of us. And you're like, yeah. (laughs) A major throwback. Oh, my gosh. Wow. But speaking of pop punk legends... Um, Jenna's also my... decided that Young Blood oh is her new <laughs> pop punk crush. I don't mean, is, is he pop? Yeah, he's pop punk, right? I feel like he just has okay. a pop punk attitude. Yeah, so I feel like this is super debatable because the way he presents is like super to me pop punk. It's very like emo throwback, like kind of scene e boy, like all of this like yeah. mix of things. But like if you just listen to his music, I feel like. It, I feel like it could be in the same category as like Five Seconds of Summer where it's like pop rock. I mean, to be fair, I haven't listened to all of his stuff. So like I could be wrong on some of this. I did see him live once actually. Um, 
but it's especially his, we're talking about specifically his new single cotton candy which i am like now obsessed with and the music video i'm also low-key obsessed with but it could just be because i haven't been around multiple humans at once in like a very long time and i'm like wow i want to party so bad <laughs> um and so yeah i'm like why is he considered like like in my head he's pop punk but in my head five seconds of summer is just a pop rock band even though to me I think m- that Dom just gives off like pop punk energy like yeah. you like walk in a room and you're like this man because like he's verging on kind of like giving off like downright punk energy because yeah, he's just I like mean- anti-establishment like is some like British like teen or like 20 year old however old he is like so writing funny. songs about like gun violence in America like doing yeah. stuff that like has nothing to do with him but being like I'm punk rock I'm wearing a dress and I'm gonna sing about gun violence I fucking like, love it like I, <laughs> like I've never I've never gotten on the young blood train before because oh this is a good segue actually into our episode <laughs> so young blood I like never appreciated when his first stuff was coming out and I don't really know I feel like it just wasn't it didn't vibe with me at the time and like I did see him live because I went to go photograph him um on assignment and Mm -hmm. I was like this is really cool like it's totally like it was so cool to see like how many teenagers are just like that's their thing for them like they're just so obsessed with young blood like I was obsessed with all-time low and it's really cool to see that but I, I still didn't I was like it's 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 cool it's not for me um but this new single I freaking love this new single, Cotton Candy, <laughs> the bass, the it's just, oh, it's so good. And I was like, this sounds like something else. I was like, this sounds like that Post Malone song. I was like, Sarah, this sounds like Circles. Well, and no, you, sent like, it, you sent me the like reels for it. And I was like, Jenna, why does this sound like something else? But I don't know what it is. And Jenna just goes, it's Circles. And I go, by all time low? <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> Honestly, I feel like I need to like dig out the archives to remember what circles by all time low sounds like. Oh, it like, doesn't sound like young blood. I'm not gonna sing yeah, it. It's I'm post Malone, too... like the biggest artist right now, okay? But, like that's it, where it, my brain lives, Jenna. You know that my brain lives in pop punk 2005 world. Okay, well, arguably post Malone is like low-key a pop punk um icon in 2020. <laughs> he is part of the Sad Boy Emo rap genre of things yeah. where it's like a failed pop punk kid turns into a successful sad boy rapper exactly yeah so the, that's 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 my updates uh dreaming about machine gun kelly and currently obsessed with young blood i guess diving into today's episode um yeah. as i mentioned we're talking about bands that for one reason or another we did not like them at the time when they were gaining traction and for one reason or another maybe we're fans now we're just gonna we're gonna tell those stories more specifically it was like not like actively being afraid of being their fan but like in a sense there was like some reason or another that you thought that like some like whether it be you're judging yourself or that like other people would judge you for liking that artist based off of like who you were I feel like at least for me that was like a lot of what was behind it I think there's like a lot to unpack here guys I'm sorry this is gonna be a full-on therapy session of unpacking all of my problems buckle up grab yourself a drink sit yeah, back pour, and relax pour yourself a drink uh <laughs> pre- prepare yourselves so I think I'm gonna start with like the most problematic <laughs> of them all and Let's then we can it. like ebb our way work to, our way like, back yeah the least problematic I feel like it's fun to just start it off spicy which is that like I did not like Paramore (laughs) which feels like I feel like I've just like betrayed every person that's (laughs) listened to this podcast to this point for how much I talk about being an emo pop punk kid but and I don't get this and I feel like we've like you actively did not like Paramore I actively did not like Paramore okay wow like it was really bad Cause like I hung out, like my main group of friends in high school were like, like high school, middle school were very much like outcast type of kids. <laughs> um, it's like the nicest way of putting what we were as. And I think that there was just like this thing. And I don't get it. Cause like I leaned in to like the emo, like hot topic lifestyle. Like the, like I, I, two days after my bat mitzvah, got the undercut of my hair dyed bright pink. And, like, I had, like, half my hair pink from the age of 13 
until I was like 16 years old. Um, We're going to have to see this photo. (laughs) Yeah. If you go on YouTube or go look at our show notes, like you'll, you can see some nice pics of me as like a tiny baby emo. Um, Yeah. I would wear like dumb, like I like had a Fall Out Boy shirt for like every day of the week. I had like this ridiculous like pink fishnet like undershirt that I used to wear under like all of my tops because I wanted to look more emo. Um, I would wear that now. <laughs> I mean, I would wear it now, but I was like 13 years old taking MySpace pics from like above my forehead. Like, yeah, like what was I doing? Um, so yeah, so I fully leaned into like this emo hot topic lifestyle and so the fact that like looking back that I did not allow myself to enjoy Paramore is like really depressing and I think that we've said this before that like there is a lot of the whole like internalized misogyny that sort of gets taught to you when you listen to like this sort of music that like you're kind of getting brainwashed by because for the first like three-ish years that I listened to that kind of music there weren't any like super popular like pop punk singers that were female but there was like Amy Lee from Evanescence but Evanescence had a way more of like a radio friendly sound in a sense and so I feel like that didn't well yeah and that too I was obsessed with Avril Lavigne so I just don't know where the disconnect happened from being like 11 years old and like really loving Avril Lavigne and like Evanescence to being 13 years old and being like I refuse to listen to Paramore stuff and we mentioned that I can't remember which episode we mentioned this in but I mean like a lot of Fall Out Boy songs are very much like not super positive about women and so and but it's like very well hidden it's like very poetically done and so I feel like there was sort of like the subliminal (laughs) underlying messaging of it all of like you don't like girls and then Paramore came out with Misery Business and she didn't like girls either And I was like, well, why should I like her if, like, this song is, like, her shitting on girls, too? Because it was the same, like, pop punk, like, math problem of, like, girl sleeps with guy, guy feels used by girl, thus, like, girl gets, like, given, like, a slut crown and sung about as a slut and nothing else. Yeah. And so, like, in Misery Business, it was kind of, like, girl sleeps with other girls' love interest. So, like, I don't know. Because that was, like, the whole thing that, like, uh, gets sort of lost in translation. So I feel like there was just that thing where I was, like, this isn't for me. And it wasn't, at that point, it wasn't, like, actively disliking. But then I think a couple years later, I, I think it was, like, when Twilight came out, everybody was, like, obsessed with Paramore. Because that song that now everybody on TikTok's obsessed with, like, was on the Twilight soundtrack. It's like, all I wanted was you. But yeah, so I feel like that came out. And then all of a sudden, all of my friends who had just, like, normally liked Paramore were, like, obsessed with Paramore. It, I just was like, no, no thanks. And I just, I don't know. Because at the time, I was playing drums. And I thought that Zach Farrow was, like, really cool because he was, like, my age or, like, a year or two older. And he was, like, the youngest drummer to be in, like, a successful rock band. But something about Haley, I just was, like, no, I don't want this. And I, th- I think it was just, like, the internalized, like, misogyny of it all. Like, just the, like, brainwashing of, like, the media of sort of pitting girls against each other. Yeah. So I just like actively was like, no thanks. And like, whenever my friends would be like, come with us to like see Paramore, I'd be like, I don't want to spend money to like see a, like see a girl trying to fit in. Like, I was so angry about it. And it's like, it's so depressing now that I like them because I'm like, they were so good. And I just did not let myself like this band. And it's like, it's really upsetting. I met Paramore. (laughs) I like my cut so like I grew up like right outside New York City and every year um from when I was like 15 to like 18 my family used to come to my house for like New Year's Eve and my cousin and I would go into the city the day of New Year's Eve and go like downtown because the city was like empty because everybody was like getting corralled into Times Square for like the ball dropping and stuff and nine times out of ten you would get to meet a celebrity that day because somebody who is like performing on a midnight like on a new year's eve show would be just like out in the city shopping because they know people aren't around so they can just like do normal stuff and my cousin and i were in an urban outfitters 
and we're about to leave and I walk face first into Zach, <laughs> like face first into him. And my like, like closest friend at the time was like obsessed with Haley Williams. And I thought it was so annoying because all she would do is like talk about Haley Williams, like every second of the day. And so like I bumped into Zach, I like apologize. And then we're leaving. And my cousin's like, that's Zach from Paramore. I was like, I know, but I don't like Paramore. So it feels really rude to ask for photos because I don't like them. And she's like, no, we have to stay in the store and we have to get photos with Paramore. And I was like, oh, fine. Okay. So we like go back to like browsing because I'm like, we're only getting photos if it's organic. I'm not going to bother this band like while they're in the store shopping. Um, and I was wearing these like slip on bands that had skulls on them. And I was looking at dresses and Haley Williams is like, comes up next to me. I don't realize this. And so, um, she like comes like there's like a woman now next to me also looking at dresses like looking at them and I guess she was like looking down she's like oh my god your shoes are so cool where'd you get them and I was like oh I got them at Hot Topic (laughs) they're bands and she's like oh that's so cool she's like can I take a picture of your shoes (laughs) and I was like yeah sure and then I looked down because like I'm like 5'8 Haley Williams is like 5'2 maybe I don't know and I'm like Oh my god, Haley Williams is like on the ground of Urban Outfitters taking a photo of my shoes. Oh my god. And I have photos, so I'll post them in the show notes so you guys can see how much of like a mess I looked in these pictures. Cause like it's that awful time of year where like it's like it's so cold outside, so you have a coat on, so you're like in the shop and you're like, do I take my coat (laughs) off? Do I leave it on? Now I'm sweaty. (laughs) So yeah, so then I'm like, oh, so then I like asked Haley for a photo and, I, and then I was, she was talking and she's like, oh, <laughs> like, and then she goes, oh, like, are you a fan of my band? I'm like, my best friend's your biggest fan. Cause like, it wasn't a lie, but I also didn't have to tell Haley Williams that I hated her. <laughs> um, and then she's like, oh my God, let's call your friend. And we called my friend and my friend did not answer her phone. Oh, that's so precious. And I think her voicemail wasn't set up, so we couldn't even, like, leave her a voicemail. And then my friend called me back, like, 10 minutes later, and I had left the store at this point, and I'm like, I can't go back to Urban Outfitters and ask this woman who I actively dislike to talk to my friend on the phone. (laughs) Like, I just can't do it. But she was so nice that I went home and I listened to Paramore. (laughs) So, I mean. Then did you convert to a fan? I didn't become a fan. I don't really think until like way later on in life, but I no longer actively hated them. So that was good. Okay. But it, it was just like the funniest thing ever where I was like, wow, she's so nice. Maybe she doesn't hate women as much as I think she does. And so (laughs) I don't know. Because I like think that I hated her because I was like told to hate women who had things I didn't have but then I also was like but she hates women that have things that she doesn't have so like how do I deal with this yeah that's crazy man that's a okay first of all that's a roller coaster of a story (laughs) but yeah just that whole thing in general is wild I feel like I didn't like Paramore because I think I was like late to the game like when they were popular I wasn't yet that into pop punk maybe I don't know I feel like timing wise I missed it and then same thing I just was never into like female vocals and to this day I'm very particular about listening to rock music with female vocals like it has to be right for me or I just don't like it yeah I feel like as I've gotten older I've got to enjoy it more and I, I feel like it, I don't know I don't know what it is I feel like that's a lot of like conditioning in a sense because I feel like I've spoken to lots of other like like female friends who are like oh yeah like I'm not really into like that rocky sound when like a girl sings yet like almost all of my friends when I was like oh like forget you is my favorite song on like the MGK record they're like Halsey sounds so good like she should do a pop punk record and I'm like you don't like what <laughs> like you don't like that yeah. though and yeah. so I think it's just a, like when you already are like accepting of somebody like like Halsey who like does something else being like oh like she can pull this off it's like she sounds the same as like other females who do this because that's a very specific sound to doing like pop punk singing so I think it's just like brainwashing (laughs) of like the media sort of thing but I think also like even though the like stan culture on the internet like wasn't as big of a problem back then I still think there was a very huge, like, issue with gatekeeping 
And I think that that made it really hard for people to kind of like like artists like Paramore a bit later on because even though they had like mainstream fame, it wasn't the same thing as like, I'm trying to think who else was popular at that time. It's not the same thing as like listening to Hilary Duff, you know? It's like Paramore has mainstream fame, but the people who like Paramore for their mainstream fame like like their singles on the radio. They don't listen really to their CDs as much so as like somebody who, I don't know, like something else like that. So I feel like there is always that fear of like fans being like, oh, you didn't listen from day one. We don't want you here. Yeah. And so I feel like that's like a big thing because like the other, like another artist who I had the issue of partially like being afraid of a fandom and partially like internalized misogyny is like Taylor Swift of like I was always like I mean personally like I'm not a huge fan of her voice like still but as I've gotten older I've been able to like acknowledge more like how much she's done for like the world of music and like women in country and like becoming like a pop star and like just everything that she's done and like how great she is to her fans and all that sort of stuff but when I was younger I just was like I hate this and I just like hated it like so much and I think it was just like a lot of like sappy love songs where I was like no thanks but also just every person I met that was like a huge Taylor Swift fan was like crazy and this was like before really like internet culture it just was like they still were very much like a crazed fandom and if you were like oh yeah like I like this cover of a Taylor Swift song they'd be like well Taylor does it better because Taylor writes for herself not for anybody else it was just always that like part of it was like oh I don't like country music which I think also is like a weird thing that everybody is told that you don't like country music (laughs) um I don't, it's just that it's, it's such an interesting conversation just like talking about artists that you were like afraid to like, or like felt like you weren't, it wasn't supposed to be for you. And I don't know if like, I feel like in my mind, Taylor Swift is very much like a poster child of like an artist that a lot of people feel like they're not supposed to like, but I don't know if that's just like personal opinion. Well, the media has also hated Taylor Swift a lot. Like this could be a whole other, this is like a whole other episode of just like how much the media hates Taylor Swift and how much they've criticized her over the years and like the whole Kanye thing. And like, yeah, even to this day, they still hate her. And weren't you talking recently about like suddenly with folklore, she was like getting all this praise. Yeah. I think that that had a lot to do with like my issue about it was that like everything I read like from these like music magazines and stuff that I trusted and believed in they were just like we don't want this like she doesn't belong anywhere because it's like oh like her first album was country and then her second album is like something that's different but like still doesn't really know where it lives and like it just felt like everyone that you're supposed to take like note from in regards to like the music stuff is like we don't want this and then the other camp is like well we don't want it either but then at the same time she's like winning all these awards and like doing really well and all this stuff and it's like well where like where does somebody like me who doesn't fit in with like the fandom like where do I belong if I want to like enjoy her music and so I was just always like okay how do I secretly like Taylor Swift without feeling like somebody's gonna come for my throat and so I just would be like anytime anybody would cover a Taylor Swift song I'd be like this is it I like I like this like this is great and I I had like friends being like oh like why do you like this like Taylor Swift cover and I'm like it's a cover of Taylor Swift like why can't I like this in peace like what's the issue with that and then I mean, I wasn't, I felt like I own 1989 on vinyl and like that record came out and I was like, this is really good. And it was like the first time that I felt like it was okay for like somebody outside of her bubble to like her, like me personally. Whereas like, it felt like it, the media, that was when they started to sort of warm up to her, but still were like, what, what are you doing? And then when folklore came out, like every single person I follow on Twitter was like, her magnum opus like taylor Mm -hmm. swift finally figured out music and it's like she's been knowing music (laughs) (laughs) yeah i don't know i never was a big fan either it was like whenever she had singles i was like okay i want to like this i want to like this 
but I, I never was a fan. I'm like, I understand it's for some people, but I just never felt like it was for me. Like, and like, I love like female pop stars. Like I love Ellie Golding. I, <laughs> I loved Cher Lloyd when she was a thing for a hot minute. I um, I actually met her at a radio station, but like, Taylor Swift, I just never, never got on board with it. I just feel like she was super polarizing, and so it made it really hard if you didn't want to jump headfirst into, like, the rocky terrain of her fandom yeah. to, like, be there, because it just felt like if you weren't part of the fandom. Yeah, and we just talked to two um, fan experts, like, about that subject with the Swifties. As I said, rocky terrain, it's interesting. I don't know. I feel like they don't get as mad, like, they don't get as mad. Maybe they do. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's, like, it's one of those things where I feel like I shouldn't be afraid of Swifties, but I think I'm as afraid of them as I am Nicki Minaj fans. Yeah, so I feel like that is, like, another example of just, like, the media kind of, like, worming into the heads of, like, young, impressionable girls and then making it harder to, like, like an artist because you're, like, well, it doesn't fit with, like, who I'm supposed to be because Mm -hmm. I am, like, hot topic emo kid. And so it's Taylor Swift for me. But, like, also, on another hand, I can maybe fight for the fact that Taylor Swift has always written emo music. But that's a whole other thing. And love Um, songs. Well, this is, uh, I mean, this will probably wind up being another episode at some point, but I feel like emo is like way more diverse of a genre than anybody wants to admit because everything from like Lord's Pure Heroine to like Taylor Swift folklore can be thought of as an emo record. So just put in, put floating that idea out there. But speaking of emo, um Ooh, the other another good segue i know i'm getting so we're all over segues. these segues today <laughs> we're all over the segues today it's like this is the thing is it's like paramore now i listen to a lot taylor swift i don't listen to as much but i do really respect her and like when she has new music come out i will listen to it and not be afraid that i'm listening to it compared to like how i used to be whereas like with this artist like this is now part of just like way more part of who i not who I am, but just, like, part of, like, my daily occurrence of music when I'm not only listening to tickets to my downfall (laughs) is that, like, I wasn't a My Chemical Romance fan. And I, like, Jenna and I were talking about this, like, before we started recording today, but, like, I was, like, a huge Fall Out Boy fan. And I'm not sure if this was, like, because I was also really young when I started listening to Fall Out Boy. I think I was, like, 12 or 13 years old when I first found out about them and so it's kind of like I just was like following what the people I was following on live journal were doing which was that every fallout boy like community that I was part of was like you can't like my chemical romance and so I don't know person like I don't remember or know like what was going on there so I don't know if there was some beef or what but I just know that it was like, you had to choose one or the other. And so I chose Fall Out Boy and I never listened to a single My Chemical Romance song until I was like 20 years of age. And so that's like six years of not listening to like emo royalty because yeah. you're like, you can be one or the other. And it's yeah. like, why? Why? Cause like another example of like bands where it's like, there's like an actual feud, like there's actual beef and issues is like Taking Back Sunday and Brand New. And I was like, I know this is really problematic, but I was a very big brand new fan. I was very much like an emo kid from Long Island. And I just like loved brand new. And it was like Jesse Lacey, who's a singer from brand new and Adam Lozara, who's a singer of Taking Back Sunday, had like some beef about a girl. And so it was like, you could like brand new or you like Taking Back Sunday. And it fully like divided Long Island. (laughs) (laughs) You live on this half of Long Island if you're a Taking Back Sunday fan and this half of Long Island. I think that they tried to do that. But yeah, I mean, but that never stopped me from also listening to Taking Back Sunday. But I could name, like, I'm a bigger brand new fan than Taking Back Sunday fan. But for some reason, because Fall Out Boy was like my favorite band in the whole world, I was like, nope, My Chemical Romance does not, is not played in this house, does not exist in this house. And it's just that weird thing of like, I... 
I just like I don't understand like the politics of it all where you're just like yeah okay I'm gonna just not listen to this band that's like objectively good and is like doing well and like the whole scene loves them except for like this group of fallout boy fans and I just was like yep no I'm a fallout (laughs) I just like I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, I don't know if that's something, I feel like that probably still exists now because you hear things about like bands having weird feuds and like all this sort of stuff where you have to pick a side. I don't know, Jenna, like if you have any examples of this because like that's all I can, all I can really think of and I don't, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> it's just so weird because like I, when I started listening to My Chemical Romance, I was like, wow, I can't believe I did this for so long. And then I genuinely think that My Chem and Fall Out Boy wound up doing a co-headlining tour like when I was older. So I feel like my thing was like, so I don't, I didn't get into pop punk into the pop punk scene until a little bit later. I was a little bit older. I think it was probably 2010 ish. And I was probably like 15. Well, okay. So maybe a little bit before, maybe like when I around when I was 14. And I just remember like, I was so into all time low and it was like nothing personal. And then I think like their newer record had come out. And so I was like listening back to like back through all the old time stuff. So I think I also just like missed the bandwagon with like Panic at the Disco. But for whatever reason, I was just so into all time low that I felt like I could never be into Panic in the Disco the same way. Like it just wasn't, it just wasn't for me. And I don't, I don't think there was a feud, but for some reason it was just like, I'm an all time low fan. So I listen to all time low and the main and Mayday Parade. And like, I don't listen to Panic at the Disco. So I, I... I feel like you lumping together all time low Mayday Parade, the main sort of thing, like that feels like one side of the coin and then like panic and like, I don't know, like the decadence, like sort of like artists, like Hush Sound, like those sort of people. It was like a very, it was more of like a Broadway pizzazz (laughs) to like, yeah. to like the pop punk sound and I'm trying to think like who else would have that (laughs) sort of vibe I don't know who else fits in there but I think it's so true that like within the Warped Tour scene like within pop punk there were so many like little bubbles of like okay these bands are the same yeah and then there was like Sleeping With Sirens and like all of those those Pierce the Veil yeah like I was never into those like I was never into Sleeping With Sirens or Pierce the Veil even though Pierce the Veil and All Time Low did a tour together they I remember they did this really big co-headlining tour and I can't remember who opened but like I was part of like all time Low's fan club so like I had meet and greet with them yeah and I was like I'd already seen them several times as I was probably 16 and I remember going with one of my friends and like our our moms took us because like our moms actually liked all time low but um it was in San Antonio so we had like parental escort and I remember I was wearing a flower crown because I was like also (laughs) on like soft grunge tumblr I was like one of those but I still listened to all time low and so like everyone who's like all the scene kids were like judging me and I like didn't care I was like yeah I'm wearing a flower crown and I'm seeing all time low (laughs) in my mind all time low is like from one side and Pierce the Veil's from the other. And I remember when they did that, like, collab song, I was, like, my my brain kind of exploded. Because I don't I was, remember like, this. Because I, they did, I can't remember what song it was called, but, like, they did this, like, collab song. And I just remember when that happened. Like, so I, like, sort of started falling off the all-time low bandwagon, like, right before Dirty Work came out. And then Dirty Work came out, and I was, like, this is a garbage pile of fire. Like, I hate this. And then I moved to London, and... A guy I had a crush on was obsessed with all time low so I was like I'll give it a shot again and then don't panic came out and I was like oh my god thank you all time low for releasing a good album when I'm trying to impress a boy didn't work but whatever but yeah like I've been I was like an all-time low fan since like their heyday like forever all time low is like unfortunately part of my personality <laughs> like I just remember sorry this has nothing to do with anything but I do remember when they went on it was Torzilla. It was them, the audition, Valencia, and Boys Like Girls, and Alex Gascar. I already like I knew him, and he was like, "Do you want to see my fake ID I just got?" <laughs> oh my god! He like comes up. He like came up to me and my friends because we were like, like my group of friends, like all time low, like knew us. Like we weren't like friends, but we were just like we were like the like comforting fan that they like knew. Where it's like if somebody's yeah. being crazy, they can kind of like give us a to look you. to be yeah. like, can you save Rescue us? Me. So like we were those. Like we were the like fan friends sort yeah. of thing. 
but yeah so Alex saw us we were like, like I think I skipped school for this tour to like go see them like to line up to like get barricade but Alex like saw us and he runs over to like come say hi and he's like guys I got a fake ID do you want to see it <laughs> Oh my gosh. Dude, on the other night, I was watching the Biden town hall and a commercial came on that all time while was playing on Good Morning America and I screamed. <laughs> oh my god. I was like, mom, do you remember when Jack Barrycat tried to buy you a drink with his fake ID and the fake ID got rejected? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> anyway, back to the regularly scheduled programming of back the to the topic plot. <laughs> of this discussion. That was a side quest over. <laughs> no, I just remember that like because Pierce the Veil was like screamo sort of in that like yeah. they had like it was like yeah there was like the singer and the screamer and so it was like a sub genre sort of thing and I just always was like oh like a, the like roads diverge in a path and like you can either go down the screamo like path or you can go down like the normal like pop punk path yeah and so when like all time low and pierce the veil like converged i was like what what is going on here <laughs> yeah that's a good point i feel like pierce the veil was like a more accessible version of the screamo bands because i was like always afraid of bring me the horizon i was just like this isn't like i was like i, I was like i'm too like I like pop punk, but I like all time low in the main. Like, I can't like bring me the horizon. This is scary. Like, just like I didn't, I never like bothered to listen to it because it was just like this stigma of like, oh, that's like hardcore. Like, I'm not that hardcore. And so then that fast forward to 2019, Bring Me the Horizon is like headlining Ali Pali and two of my band, like two separate bands. Which, friends. if you don't know what Ali Pali is, Ali Pali is. Alexander Palace in London, which is a 10,000 capacity venue that is also like a historic landmark and like people go ice skating there in the winter and like it's like historic British grounds. So it's like a huge deal. It's insane. Yeah. And I got, so I just got to see Wolf Alice sell out Ali Pali when I was studying abroad, which was incredible. (laughs) But um, anyway, so like Bring Me the Horizon, like it was playing Ali Pali and I had like several like different band friends who were at the London show. And I was like, all right, well, I'm friends with these people and I like their music and they all like Bring Me the Horizon. So like, what am I missing out on? Like Bring Me the Horizon is this huge thing that I just like don't know about. So I listened to their record, which was uh, at the time, the most recent one was Te Amo, and I loved it. It was like this, okay, granted, it was this really weird, like, kind of screamo, but, like, futuristic, grimesy, like, what is happening, Ooh. electronic stuff. Was that the first record that they had that sort of, like, genre-bended? Because I know that, like, they went, like, when I was younger, when I was younger, Ollie Sykes spit on my camera at a concert, so that was real fun. He was, like, in, I'll, I'll put a photo up on YouTube and the show notes too, but I have a photo of him like right in the face of my camera and then afterwards he spit on it. So um, yeah, they were like very scary scream, like screaming when I was like younger. And then I remember at some point there was like all this like drama online because they started like genre bending and there was like lots of conversation about it. I don't know if that was the first record. They had another record that was like that because Mm -hmm. one of the songs on the record is like, there's a kid on the internet in like a black Dahlia tank like telling me I'm not screamo or something like that that's like one of the songs and so it was like I like at the time of that had already been happening so I don't know if it was like a previous record or like a singles or what I don't know the history I honestly haven't listened to their back catalog either I listened to that record it it was that bring me the horizon is one of my top streamed artists on Spotify (laughs) because I went through such a big phase with that record last year um and then recently they've put out like one they've put out a lot of records since like they've already had like two more records but they recently did a single with young blood yeah that i also love so now i'm just like remembering how much i love that bring me the horizon record but at the time like i was just like too scared of like what they were doing there were just a lot of artists that like were really successful in that like warp tour bubble of like a mashup of genres where it's like because of like what their fans are like or because of what like your friends or like the scene that you're a part of like like the sub scene that you're a part of within the warp tour scene like what these people would think of you and so i just think it's so crazy like how polarizing just being a music fan like being a fan of music can be where it's like you have to fit within like a bubble or you feel like your peers are gonna judge you or like act a certain way or whatever the case may be and I just feel like it's sad because I feel like all of the artists that like we've brought up today 
they're all friends with each other like, yeah like they all like taylor swift and Haley williams are like friends and like everybody's like connected and I, so i just don't understand where like the disconnect is of like the fandoms being like oh like you can only like one or the other or like if you like this like you shouldn't like this when it's like but all these people like hang out and like write together and like mm-hmm. do stuff together sometimes they even tour together and it's still just like you don't you feel like you don't belong when you're like a young impressionable teen and like somebody you look up to makes you feel like oh like you can't you can only like follow boy or my chemical romance you're like oh okay well like if this girl who's like the moderator of this live journal community i'm a part of tells me not to like my chem i don't like my chem so i have another band that's like really has been really polarizing 21 pilots yeah because the, okay so i have my personal story and then but I just feel like they like were kind of in the all like the indie world, like the alt rock world, yeah. but like they have a lot of fans who I feel like converted from pop punk to 21 Pilots fans. Like they either loved them or they hated them. Like honestly, everyone who likes 21 Pilots, you either love them or you hate them. So I knew them like when their first, their very first record came out. This was probably like, I don't remember, 2013 or 2014 when their first record came out. Because I, because Ashley Osborne was tweeting about them because she had mm-hmm. like worked with them and they were playing South by like South by Southwest in Austin. And so because she tweeted about them, I went to go see them. And it was really funny because they played at like, they played in the parking lot of like the local <laughs> record store. And well, it was like a big deal. Like they converted the parking lot. No, no, into- no I know. It's just like funny imagining 21 Pilots like being able to play in a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, the story gets better. So they would like block off the whole parking lot and like turn like have a tent and everything and probably like a thousand people could fit in there and macklemore played right before them and this is when um the like the thrift store song was really popular and it was packed like it was people all the way to the back like breaking down the fences to see macklemore and it like it was so crazy and like the sounds like shut off on him like the sound system overheated and like shut off so we only played like half a set and then everyone cleared out and there was like 200 people left and who were like sticking out to see 21 pilots because we, we were like weren't sure if they were gonna be able to perform or not because like the sound system overheating and so they they were able to perform and it was like the craziest experience like as much showmanship as they have now they had it back then too of like Mm -hmm. um tyler like climbing the scaffolding um but he like went into like the crowd and stuff and it was just so cool i was like mesmerized by it and i bought their record to like get it autographed and everything um and so like i was super into that record and then blurry face came out i think it was 2015 and i was really into blurry face too but they were like i just feel like they were very much in like that in the indie world like the the alt rock world at the time and i went to see them at acl festival austin city limits Mm -hmm. and you know of course that's a festival so there was massive amounts of people there and i felt like like suddenly i was realizing that there were so many young teenagers who were fans of 21 pilots and they were like going to hot topic and like buying their t-shirts it was like the new generation of like the scene kids who like all love 21 pilots and it was really cool to see, but it was kind of disheartening for me because I was like, I love this band, but I loved them when they were tiny. Now they're so big and they're like, so like, they're not as accessible. And I just don't fit in with their fandom yeah. that I kind of just like dropped off to listening to them after that. It's really interesting to talk about like the other way around because I feel like it's really common to like have situations where it's like, oh, like I didn't like Paramore because like, I was brainwashed to like hate women or like whatever the thing is but I feel like it's much less common to hear about people being like I really liked them when they were small and then because of what their fan base turned into I felt like I didn't belong but I feel like that's been a lot of my issue with like the main and their fandom just became like super unaccessible to people like me who were just like I don't know where I belong. Like when you go to shows now and they're like, oh, like 8123 is like a community and a family. And then you like talk to people. It's like, no, this is super toxic and like not good because there's still that whole like hierarchy of fans who are like, they know our names. So we're better. And it's like, I think it's really admirable to like try and create like a fan community in the way that the main has. But I also think that like when you do that, 
there's always going to be fans that have like an air of self-importance and so it makes it like less accessible to people especially like fans who've been around for like a really long time because like newer fans are kind of like oh like we we have to like tour we have to like follow them we have to do our own tour with the tour yeah and so it's like people who are older who like like them back in the day or whatever it's like we have jobs (laughs) like we're not like college students like we can't just like drop everything and follow them around so like now these new fans are like we're the queens of the, the main fandom so like no one else is allowed and it's like yeah I feel like that exact reason is why because I feel like I haven't been like in a true fandom and so like since I was a teenager since I like yeah. maybe my freshman year of college like I haven't been in a fandom and I think like for me it was just like a lot to keep up with and feeling like I couldn't keep up with the other fans who were more dedicated or like had more time to be more dedicated yeah it's a weird feeling but then at the same time like I have like band friends who like I've known since they were starting out and like I still talk to them I'll still go see them on tour like occasionally I'll drive to like Houston if they're not playing Austin if I really want to see them but yeah yeah it's it's totally different than being in the in the fandom and like knowing what's going on online and like going and like waiting hours for a show and stuff like that it's just that weird thing when you're like in the middle because I feel like people who are just like fans who like listen to the record a lot but like aren't part of fandom culture like I feel like they don't have these issues like when they go and see bands but I feel like if you were like part of the fandom in the beginning or like are friends with an artist or something like that where you're like in this weird middle realm of like you know them or like you've worked with them or like you used to be a really big fan and then you weren't anymore and then they made more music that you liked because like your music taste grew or whatever like so now you're a fan again like you're in that weird middle part where it's like you're more than just an average day listener but you're like not part of the fandom and so it's like you want to go line up maybe to like see this band but you feel like if you line up and you're like standing in line next to the wrong person they're gonna be like do you really like do you belong here yeah because like we talk a lot about like men being like a three-song man but i feel like there is there's that issue where like women feel like you're supposed to be pitted against each other and not so much like women but more like teen girls are like taught like oh like other women aren't your friends like you're against them like if they're not with you they're against you and so i feel like until you're old enough to like grow out of that there's always going to be the issue of like if you're not like part of a faction of a fandom it's like who are you like what are you doing here why yeah, there's very much that gatekeeping factor yeah and so it's just it's just interesting like the juxtaposition between like a three-song man and like the girl who gatekeeps because like she thinks that her faction of a fandom is like more important and like the part that you are a part of but yeah so I don't know I just feel like there's so many artists that are it's just very interesting of like the difference between like feeling like you can't really be a big fan of an artist anymore it's like such a depressing thing and I feel like that is kind of what happened to me with the 1975 because Mm -hmm. like their first two records I was just so into them I was like a 1975 fan to my core and then I felt like their fandom got so big and I had less time to be a part of it that it was just like overwhelming. Like I didn't know where I fit in with it. I felt like there's so many people who are going to like camp out to wait to see them. And like, I want to see them, but I don't, I'm not going to camp out. Like I, I can't have that level of dedication anymore. Yeah. And then I know I was like abroad when um they were releasing the singles like leading up to a brief inquiry and I listened to the I was into the singles and then like they put out that record in like November or something and this is when I was in Australia if you remember yeah. in 2018 and I think I was just so depressed when I got back home that I just didn't listen to that record at all. Mm-hmm. Like I straight up did not, I've never like listened to that record all the way through. And then even with their new record, I just felt like I was so out of the loop of like the fandom that I can't even catch up. And like, I love the 1975 still. Like, I'm not going to say I'm not a fan. Like, absolutely. I love them. I even went yeah. to see them on the last like tour they did. But then I realized how much music I don't know, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. And I think it was just like, it got too far away from me. Like, it felt like it, it was feels like a job overwhelming yeah it was like overwhelming to be that dedicated anymore and like that's the thing is it's like I think that like what the internet has made a, like possible for fandom to become I think in some ways it's really beautiful but like in other ways can be really daunting and exhausting I can just like make it really hard to like 
love music from a band that's always meant something to you because you feel like oh I used to take part in all of this and now that I can't I don't know where I fit in anymore and like the fact that fandom has gotten to such a level of toxicity that you feel like you can't even listen to a record because like you can't take part in the same way you used to is just like yeah sad I know but yeah I feel like we could probably talk about this for hours and we don't need to make our lovely listener friends deal with that but I feel like this has been a really interesting conversation I honestly thought it was gonna be just like us being like this we thought this man sucked and then they didn't but it's actually been very insightful Yeah, it turned into a great conversation. And I would love for anyone who's listening, I would love to know if there are bands that you feel this way about. One way or another, either you loved them and you fell off or other way around, you felt like you couldn't be a part of their fandom for one reason or another. Yeah, I feel like this is definitely something that I feel like I ask you this every single time and nobody comes to us on Twitter and I don't... I don't know why, but no, please. Even if you just want to like slide in our DMs, our DMs are always open. But yeah, come tweet with us. We'd love to converse more about this if you relate to us and the artists that we've mentioned, or if there's other ones that you've like felt similarly about. Come tweet at us at name three songs. And then also you can talk to us personally if you want. Um, I'm Sarah underscore Fagan and then Jenna's Jenna underscore million. We're always open for conversation, obviously, since this is all we do is talk about music all the time. So come continue the conversation with us. We'd love it very much. So thanks for joining us on Name Three Songs. Until next time, never let anyone make you feel bad about your favorite band. And remember, you're never too cool to listen to Harry Styles. And don't forget to subscribe to be notified when each episode comes out. And leave us a five-star review. They really help. If you want to find out more about anything we talked about today, including Sarah's photo of being a scene kid, <laughs> you can visit name3songs.com.